This is an introduction to environmental communication. Today you're going to get an introduction to the field, introduction to the topics we'll cover, and finally an introduction to the course assignments and assessments. First I want to preview the most interesting part of this course, your interpretive talk. At the beginning you will choose a site and an issue, you'll record interviews with a couple experts, and you will conduct initial research on your topic. In the middle, you'll do in-depth research and script an interpretive talk. At the end, you'll rehearse and record your talk. Essentially, you're going to be doing what a ranger does, only in audio podcast form rather than as a live performance, like you see here in this picture. But what is environmental communication? I first am going to read this definition, and don't worry, I won't do much of that, but then I want to go over these specific terms. Environmental communication is the pragmatic and constitutive vehicle for our understanding of the environment, as well as our relationships to the natural world. It is the symbolic medium that we use in constructing environmental problems and negotiating society's different responses to them. So what do these specific terms mean? Pragmatic is pretty clear. In fact, that's what people often think of when they think of communication or environmental communication, that it's how effectively does one communicate facts and ideas from speaker A to listener B. And that is part of what we'll be doing, as you'll see. But the part that they often don't think of is the way in which communication is not just a neutral act that's good or bad, but in fact that the way we communicate has the influence of actually changing the nature of relationships, institutions, and perceptions of reality. For example, this talk is online. The fact that where it's mediated electronically changes the situation compared to if we were in the same room. So communication constitutes certain reality. And it does so in part as a symbolic medium, meaning that it's not just about facts and information, but rather that there's deeply held cultural symbols that articulate with all kinds of other meanings that are not just part of the surface facts and ideas. And therefore, we construct realities through communication. We don't just express existing facts. And therefore, we also have to remember that these are different perceptions of reality. Now, one does not have a right to make up facts. A certain chemical compound is a chemical compound. But when you get above that level of fact to the ways in which things are perceived, or policies, or what we're going to do in a local place or an environment, as you very much know, these things are contested. They're political. And therefore, there's always a negotiation, a contest, over different responses and different perspectives. And we're going to look at those environmental politics as well. Environmental communication is an interdisciplinary field. Now what I mean by that is people from all kinds of scholarly disciplines get involved in it. From English literature to art. So for example, we're going to interview Dan Philippon, who is an expert in English literature, around environmental communication. Or Lori Allman, a local artist, poet, and videographer who does artistic works around environment. We're going to interview her and see one of her works as well. To public policy in the environmental sciences, here we have Carissa Slaughterback, who will interview about policy issues. She's at the Hubert Humphrey School of Public Policy. Or Jason Hill, whose incredible work around ethanol, his science, about ethanol. He has had to communicate to Congress and other policy-making bodies as they determine what kind of subsidies there should be around sub, uh, ethanol, what kind of regulations. So all of that is extremely important and part of environmental communication. Within the discipline of communication studies, it's studied in the National Communication Association that has an environmental communication division, and the International Communication Association, which also has and environmental communication division. And then there's the International Environmental Communication Association, 
in some ways a much more specific field where communication studies scholars come together to just focus on environmental communication, but which also involves scholars from outside the discipline of communication studies. So scientists, policy makers, policy scholars, and others get involved in it. What kind of methods do we use to study environmental communication? Well, the same range of methods we use to study communication in general. One is rhetorical analysis, the way in which language is employed. Let me give you one example. Chris Russell and Zoe Nisa wrote a great article called The Tipping Point Trend in Climate Change Communication. And they demonstrate that this term actually comes from the social sciences, makes its way into the popular culture, and only then is it adopted by scientists as a way to explain climate change models. And it even, as a concept, generates new mathematical modeling. For example, a very important article in Nature, the Journal of Nature by John Foley talks about tipping points in the environment and shows mathematically that there is such a thing, that they are a good way of looking at the way in which environmental systems work. But without this rhetorical analysis, we would not know the legacy, the etymology, that is the history of this term, and that in fact informs how we understand climate change communication and climate change in general. Here's what I do, ethnographic research. That means you spend a lot of time with a group of people that is germane to your subject. In this case, my latest group is environmentalist musicians spending a long time with them in performance, watching them perform, interviewing them, and even in some cases performing with them. In order to understand how they think and what they do, in my case this ethnographic research had to do with informing other musicians around the world how they might improve their practices and think about adopting some of the novel strategies that my informants employed on stage and within movements. And then there's quantitative content analysis. It's like rhetorical analysis in that it looks at language, but rather than using a qualitative approach, it actually uses accounting and statistical procedures in order to understand how language changes over time or comparing different uh, bodies of text. For example, here we have Max Boykoff, whose work on climate uh, communication has been fundamental. Long before it was a topic on John Oliver or the popular media, he looked at the question of false balance, for example, the way in which media, uh, news media, mainstream media, were making a balance between those that believed that climate change was happening and later that it was anthropogenic versus those that, that did not think either of those was the case. And he pointed out by using a quantitative approach and looking at a very broad, as one is able to via quantitative methods, a very broad uh, range of media um, texts, that they were in fact falsely balancing these two views, giving the false impression that scientists themselves were much more um, divergent on that basic question than they in fact were and are. But as he points out, in much of the news, that false balance was dropped. Not so for in the case of TV news, however. Those are just three of many methods. Interviews, focus groups, we could go on, uh, different types of methods that are used, experimental methods. But that's mainly the academic disciplines and what kind of methods they bring to the study of it. What about the professions? Who practices environmental communication? This is where we really amplify the, the um, course to look at a whole range of types of people. Policy folks, whether it's Congress, politicians, regulators, lobbyists, there's any range of people that discuss environmental policy and want to know how to do it more effectively and meaningfully. There's advertisers who want to get a green message across. Um, or in some cases, one might call it greenwashing when it is in fact not a terribly sustainable product or practice or brand, but they want to, through PR, give that impression. All of those things are important to look at. NGOs, non-governmental organizations, advocacy groups, and nonprofit groups might want to advocate for certain positions and therefore present certain perspectives on the environment. 
as do musicians and artists. And while they are not necessarily strategic communicators in, in terms of trying to influence somebody, per se, to adopt a certain perspective, their interpretations of environment and nature and place are often very important. And perhaps they should be more important as, in the way that we all interact with nature, to understand it in new and creative ways. But finally, the profession I want to mention are the people that do this every day in a very direct way, and that is our public employees at parks and other locations, rangers, that are constantly communicating place to visitors, to publics. And if we think about what it is a ranger does, we can get at the sort of fundamentals of what all environmental communicators seek to do. So we'll all become rangers this semester. What environmental communication topics will we cover? Well, there's historical conceptions of the environment, the way in which ideas about the environment have changed over time. So here we have Teddy Roosevelt talking to John Muir, two people with very different ideas of the environment. Yet, since they lived at the same time, they also shared some ideas about the environment that were popular at the time that have changed. Studying that historically can give us new perspectives on the present. Symbolic construction of environmental problems. Take the, the, the example of charismatic megafauna. That's another word, uh, way of saying the kind of big animals we like. So, polar bears. Polar bears are often used as a symbolic representation. What Cox and Pizzullo, the editors of um, your textbook called condensation symbols, so that all of climate change is represented in the plight of the polar bear. And as they point out, that does something in terms of extending our knowledge and ideas and communication about the environment, but also such symbols limit. There are some problems with focusing completely on charismatic megafauna, for example. So we'll look at the ins and outs and the details and the human processes of communicating through symbols. Arts and popular culture, which I've already mentioned. News, the way in which journalists discuss events and how those events tie into environmental and often very complex topics. So how do you present that in the news? Social media, as we learned recently in the election, Many people do not get information about distant happenings and distant issues and large social questions through the news anymore, but directly through social media. So for better or for worse, how does social media mediate environment? And also technologies. How do we in interact with our environments technologically? You can imagine very few of us um, interacting with a local environment without some sort of technological mediation, even when it's very direct, as in the case of this picture. Communicating science. How does a scientist or a policymaker or an advocate communicate complex ideas to a public or to policymakers, which we'll find out is often more important. How do you directly talk to those that can make the change that you want to see happen? Risk communication. How are publics informed and thus allowed to deal with toxins, pollution, and other risks to their livelihood, to their communities, to their families? Public participation. We are lucky to be in a democracy where at the local, regional, state, and national level, we can get directly involved in influencing policy. Those processes, however, are often very unknown to people. In this course, they will become known. You'll become more skilled and understand how it is you can get involved directly in dealing with environmental issues. Movements and campaigns, the way in pe which people collectively come together to advocate for a shared vision, in this case, a climate, change, climate action movement. Advertising and PR, which I already mentioned, as extremely important. One of the reasons I think is important is not just for those that are going into marketing or for consumers to be able to critically analyze advertising, but also because many of the skill, skills that are related to strategic communication apply in other domains than advertising and PR, whether you're working for a nonprofit organization 
or a large company. It's important to understand some of the techniques of strategic communication to do it well. And finally, environmental law. Amidst all that, which environmental issues will we mainly focus on? Well, first and most important is your main issue of interest. That's why we have an individualized project. You can go out, choose a site that you care about or will come to care about, but also almost all environmental issues are possible at these sites. And so pick one that you care enough about to deal with for the entire semester. Climate change. The reason climate change is kind of a common denominator throughout much of this is because it's one that, as a global question, involves all of these different subtopics and genres. Biodiversity issues also thread throughout. So think about invasive species, the ways in which if you have an invasive species that's taking over a local ecosystem, it reduces the number of other species, it crowds them out, um, outcompetes them, and thus reduces biodiversity. Or habitat conservation, wherein one produces, helps steward an ecosystem in such a way that you will increase uh, ha eco ecosystemic health and therefore have greater biodiversity. And then finally, other forms of species preservation. Environmental justice will be important throughout as well, because when you think about it, these issues are never just nature absent from human beings. There really is no such thing as that today. And environmental benefits, that is who gets access to clean water, nice environments, parks, and environmental costs, that is who bears the brunt of overconsumption, such as wasted sites, dump sites, or what's called sacrifice zones, are inordinately people of color and the poor. And therefore, justice is fundamentally important to thinking about environmental issues. And environmental health. So important to throughout to think about the way in which all of our bodies as human beings, individually and collectively, are connected to our local ecosystem. That is a lot, so how will we cover all of that? The assigned readings, and it's mainly the textbook in here for a reason, because it does a good job of covering these topics. Our lectures, interviews, and the weekly audio podcast, and an individualized focus on your main project, which is the interpretive talk assignment. Now I want to say just a little bit more about this. The interpretive talk is what a ranger does. They interpret something in a site, an issue, and they use those resources in order to educate and inform, engage, and even entertain a public. You'll be doing that via an audio podcast step by step. What public land field sites can you choose? Well, the main criterion here, and you'll see there's a list of them um, offered in the weekly uh, instructions, is that you choose a site that has a nature center and good interpretive resources already there to get you started. And thus, I also want it to be a site that has a ranger, or stewards, or at least volunteer staff on hand as well. So that is the following types of sites. A national park. You can't beat the national parks in terms of the ways in which they present sites of public lands that we all own as a country to the public. So here in Minnesota, we have Voyageurs National Park. We have uh, Isle Royale National Park, the least visited park in the entire country. But it's kind of hard to get to those, isn't it? So you're probably not necessarily going to be using 
those in this course because you have to get there at least twice during the semester, once at the beginning, once at the end. And so I want to caution you that unless you really love one of these sites and want to explore it and have the time and resources to do so, it might not work. However, the National Park System, um, if you look at their website, has several other sites that are not national parks, but rather monuments and other sorts of, of uh, sites they run in Minnesota and the upper Midwest that are closer, one of which is extremely close. The Mississippi River Gorge runs right through the middle of campus, and it is part of the national park system. There's even a couple rangers assigned to it. And there's interpretive plaques along the way, or if you combine it with the Upper Mississippi Nature Center, you could put that together. Now, some of you might be saying, great, I can stay right by campus and do this. Yet, I really want to caution against that unless you have a proactive interest in that. Because in some ways, it'll be the hardest thing to do. Because it does not have as much in terms of interpretive resources and access to rangers as these other set parks will, which will work much better for this project. So feel free to, to use another part of the national park system other than a national park, but I caution you, it's going to be very difficult. You have to really love it and have a proactive interest in it. And then there's federally designated or state wilderness areas, such as the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, the BWCA. We usually leave the NW off, as you know. But once again, this is far away, but there's a wilderness area that you could use public transportation to get to that's underutilized for this course. And that is the Minnesota River Valley Wilderness Area that you can get to via light rail. It's only about a quarter mile walk to their interpretive center, and then you can walk in a trail right into the wilderness area. It's really a good one, and I strongly recommend it for this course. And then there are the state parks. If there is one type of site that will universally always work and always work well for this project, it is the state park system. If you choose a state park locally or outstate or in Wisconsin or the Dakotas, you cannot go wrong. For example, Itasca State Park, an excellent one, but even close into um, Minneapolis, you can take light rail once again, walk a little bit, and get down to Fort Snelling State Park, which is in the area called Bedote, where the Minnesota River and the uh, Mississippi River come together, the sacred center for the Dakota. Fort Snelling is an excellent place to go, or any of the state parks, Afton State Park, Lake Mariah State Park, um, both of which are near to the Twin Cities, because they will have they have excellent um, interpretive resources, such as a nature center. They have rangers, and they have on-site staff, and they have excellent websites, and a lot of work is done there, and they're local and easily accessible. So if you're not quite sure what site you want to choose, choose a state park. You can't go wrong. Now, one that is sort of on the opposite extreme and very difficult to use unless you already have access or really entrepreneurially want to get access to this and are very interested in issues of pollution is a Superfund site. Superfund sites are either private or public sites that are extremely polluted. So much so that Congress has dedicated billions and billions of dollars to cleaning them up because they are a public hazard. So, for the sake of this course, you want to use a Superfund site if you're very interested in public health and pollution issues and if you want to go out of your way to try to get access to them by talking to staff um, that, that steward the site, cleanup officials, or others so that you can get that access. But I caution you, it's not always easy to get that access and a semester goes by pretty quickly. So, if you're very interested in issues of uh, toxins and um, cleanup and policy, Superfund sites are great, but only if you're very interested in that. Uh, for example, public health majors um, have been encouraged to choose Superfund sites when they use this course as an elective. 
And finally, that brings us to one other local resource that's excellent. The Three Rivers um, Park District has several reserves that have nature centers and on-site um, staves and rangers to help you out. And they have excellent trails that are, have interpretive resources on the trails, placards and uh, trail guides. And they'd love to help you out. So there's a list of those presented as well. This picture is of an Elm Creek Reserve that's up near Maple Grove, an excellent site to use for this assignment. But don't just use any county or city park. Use one that has a nature center and staff on hand that are doing interpretive work. So the Three Rivers system that is Hennepin County is excellent, um, as are some adjoining counties and their uh, nature centers and interpretive resources. Lebanon Hills in Dakota County is, is another example. So they exist, but make sure you ask um, in order to, to determine that it really will work for this assignment. Now the question of why we do this becomes fundamental for understanding how to do it well. We do this in part because we are a public land grant institution. The University of Minnesota sits on land that was given to the university and the regions by the federal government uh, over 150 years ago under the premise that we would help steward the state's resources effectively. And that is exactly what you are doing in this course. You are advancing the common good and public lands by studying them and doing work on them and learning how to better communicate public issues to the public in a democratic and informative way. So there's probably not many classes where you felt like, gee, I'm advancing the public land grant mission of the university. In this one, if you do it right, you will be. So now that we've gotten past the meat of what the, cor the, of what the course is going to be about, let's look at a few policy issues that are going to be important. Please follow along in your syllabus. We'll jump around a little bit, but you can download a copy from the Moodle site. First, course communication. Email. Use it early and often. That's the best way to contact me. I check it daily, and I will respond to you at least within a day to tell you that I've got the message. And if it takes a, a longer response, I will do so at least within two or three days. Um, email can't do everything, though. There are many issues for which I'll get an email, and it's a complex question of writing or feedback where I'll say, come into office hours so we can talk, where we can do that well. See the syllabus in Moodle regarding when my office hours are this semester. A very important part of this course is you and I meeting individually in the third week. So sign up for that meeting right away. And in the third week, you and I will talk mainly about your interpretive talk project, helping you choose a site and an issue that you care about that will work well for this assignment and for this course. As I said, my name is Mark Peddlety. Um, this is my email, and I'm at 268 Ford Hall. The best way to find me there by far is to come during office hours because often I'm elsewhere on campus or off campus doing other work, other meetings uh, during the week. I guess I should probably mention a little bit about my background in addition to the fact that my recent ethnographic research I mentioned. I, um, previous to that, have been doing other work around music in the environment, music is environmental communication, and musical ritual, both in Mexico, the United States, and as well in Canada. My PhD is in anthropology from Berkeley, and that is one of the reasons why I do ethnographic research. I'm trained as an ethnographer, and so I have that particular methodological perspective in terms of my own research. That's enough about me. Let's get back to you and how you do well in this course. The first thing you want to think about is taking it week by week. And simply do these same things every week and you'll do well. The students that often falter are those that for some reason either initially have a hard time getting into the rhythm of doing these, these basic steps each week, or as the semester goes on, some 
how forget that if they do these three things, they'll do well. They forget one step. So get into that practice, that discipline of doing these things every week. They are read the weekly reading. Now, I know some courses give you a whole lot of reading, and it's almost impossible to do it all. You do triage and say, well, I'll focus more on this or on this. I don't do that. This is very focused, intensive reading. I give you an amount of reading that is certainly doable in a week, and I expect you to, to read it and to use it. And if you don't, you won't probably do very well in the course. Also watch the weekly videos. Sometimes they're a little bit longer like this one, but more often they're pretty short, and that is by design to be very focused. Listen to the weekly podcast. This isn't a podcast, the Public Lands podcast, that I'm able to do things that respond to week-by-week week changes out there in the news, in terms of what, you could, what a person could do with an interpretive assignment, and so on. So those are going to be a very important. They're one of the more dynamic aspects of this course. The podcast is not part of the course per se. It's something that I am doing on the side. But it's something that I think really adds value to the course because, as I said, it's more dynamic. It allows you to think about the ways in which these issues are not just part of a perfunctory class experience to get credentialed or, or, or graduate, but really can be part of life. Discussion forum. This is a place where you discuss the readings, and every week I'll give you some sort of prompt. In those weeks I don't, where you don't have written instructions that give you a prompt, and those are mainly when you're entering an audio file, and that'll be clear every week when that is, you'll just generally discuss whatever is sort of on people's mind, that's from the podcast or the videos, the readings. But most week you'll get an explicit prompt that tells you what it is that I'd like you to start discussing on the forum. And of course things will move from there. You might find somebody else is doing work on butterflies and you're very interested in that. And you start talking to them as well. That's all great. That will all go into your, your participation grade at the very end. And it will be graded at the very end. So take it seriously every week. But every week the way in which you get your weekly grade and in fact the by percentage most important grade in this course is your weekly report which is usually about two to four paragraphs that are very specifically prompted around a specific topic that demonstrate, one, that you've done and thought about the reading and the, and the topic for the week, that you're able to take that and from, work from the video or the podcast and work it into your own research project to enhance your project in some ways. Sometimes they're sort of thought experiments to help you get your project going better. In other t cases, they're very pragmatic, very specific, that says, do this for your weekly assignment to do it well. Follow those prompts. Do that. You'll find it's not in, an inordinate amount of work, but it is organized. So if you follow that organizational pattern, you'll do great. So one of the ways it's organized is to check the boxes each week. Now, you'll notice there's only three boxes, yet I had five different things that you're doing. Well, if you check these boxes and do these things, you will catch all of those. First, you'll watch the videos, and then you will listen to the podcast. And then the instructions and report ask you to use the readings, so you'll remember to do the readings. They will give you a prompt for the discussion forum, so you'll remember to do the discussion forum. And you will complete your weekly report, and it'll, it'll step you through what to do for that. Most often, most often, doing something around your site. Now, I don't necessarily mean going to your site. As I said, uh, in minimal form, you have to go there at least twice, once at the beginning, once at the end. If your site is nearby, you'll probably be expected to go more than that because it's better if you can go multiple times in order to keep going back to get the information and do the work you want to do. But regardless, every week you'll be doing something in terms of research or writing or development that has to do with your site and your topic. So check the boxes each week. You'll do well. The reading. The evolution of the textbook is something I want to mention. It's a really good textbook and it's gotten better and better. For example, in this last edition they added visual and popular culture and I'm really glad they did because it's an important topic to bring to the conversation. Additional reading. Um, 
If you have any additional reading, at current, I've only assigned one, but do look, look every week because the prompt will tell you it's there, and that PDF for free will be listed that week for you to just open and read. So if there is additional reading, and there will always be maybe one or two, it will be listed in that week, and it will be clear it's available. But the perhaps more important additional reading beyond the textbook is the reading that you bring to the course. Now, to do your interpretive talk well, you'll use some websites, you know, for example, a state park website or a website about your invasive species. But more importantly, you'll move on to news stories. Think, uh, people that have gone greater depth to think about events and ideas and issues that relate to your site. But even more importantly when we talk about additional reading is you will not stop there. That's sort of the low-hanging fruit. You will also do rigorous library research to come up with at least one, and hopefully more, academic journal articles or other academic materials, books or reports, on your topic. So that you look at those that have spent their time to research this topic and it's gone through peer review so you learn something more about it to bring to the table. I emphasize that here so strongly because sometimes students try to get by by just doing sort of web research. And for them, they look at something on Google and they think that, wow, this news article or this website is about the same thing as getting a journal article off of, uh, say, Academic Search Premier or uh, another proprietary data set, uh, database that the university has access to. They're not the same thing. They're all valuable, but they're very different. And nothing replaces serious research for looking at your topic. So that will be part of what you do in this 4,000 level course. I recommend this book, and it's available for free, or at least access to it is available for free on Moodle. Um, and that is because even though it's about a live ranger talk and interpretive work that's live performance, it deals with a lot of issues that will help you. How to tell a story, how to take complex ideas and, and turn them into something that a public would want to hear, how to be true to the science, yet at the same time be entertaining, and also how to use voice. So really recommended reading. Many of the chapters in Susan Strauss's book are really useful for doing your interpretive talk project. You will be um, watching a documentary film called Music Wood, and it gives you a behind the scenes look at an environmental campaign and therefore gives us a, an example to analyze when we're thinking about environmental campaigns. Now let's think a little bit about those weekly reports so you get an idea, a little bit more coaching on what you'll do there, and then we'll move into some uh, more nitty-gritty policies. First, the weekly reports are right for step-by-step -step learning and reporting about the interpretive talk project. They take you from the start all the way up to your final interpretive talk. And if you follow those steps along the way, you'll do great. If you don't, and then at the end try to make up for it, it does not work well. Not only will your weekly report grades not be that great, but your final interpretive talk won't be as good. These reports ask you to bring in concepts and material from the reading and relate them to your interpretive talk project. Um, and uh, it is here, therefore, why I'm emphasizing it, because it brings everything in the course together in one place where you think about them and show that you've really uh, done the work, thought about this, and creatively are able to apply it. The report topics then lead to productive discussions in the discussion forum with your peers. They're graded on a very simple rubric. We don't get into the business of really detailed um, grading of the sort of week to week. We'd rather give you uh, feedback so that you recognize these are fairly broad assignments and there's a lot of different ways you can skin this cat. But the rubric does let you know what you're doing well or poorly. So if it's a question of writing, if it's a question of substance, if it's a question of content, it's a, if it's a question of not responding to the questions, um, you will know this via looking at your rubric every week. Course policies, other things that will help you do well, and even perhaps more importantly, things that will help you avoid pitfalls that, that I see semester to semester when students do, when some students do poorly. 
This is probably the most important. It's a simple, simple policy. As opposed to the complex university policy, which requires you to have documentation and try to find makeups for every single thing, this puts the control in your hands. And I'm not going to allow you to give it back to me, because that's what some students try to do. I want you to keep it. In your hands is the choice to drop three weeks' worth of discussion forums, three weeks' worth of written reports. In other words, you could miss an entire three weeks of this course and still do just as well as somebody that didn't miss those three weeks. That's very generous, and it's fair. And it does not require you to have a excu uh, written excuse, and it keeps it in your control. Where things become a problem is twofold. One, somebody says, but I had technical problems the very last day when I tried to submit this on a Sunday, remembering you have all week to do it, and so I need an extension. Our answer will be, no, please read the syllabus policy. It's very fair. This is adult education. You're adults, and I put it in your hands to use your three drops, three weeks' worth of drops, three in each of those categories of weekly assignments, as you see fit. At the end of the class, we will drop Three, your three lowest scores. In fact, when you see your scores, as there's more than three of them there, Moodle will start dropping your three lowest scores automatically so you can see how well you're doing. But what happens, since there's no extensions or incompletes, there's just three drops that are in your control, what happens if halfway through the course you've done well and you're in good standing and then you get so sick that you can't finish the course? That's what incompletes were made for. That's what I want you to ask for if you're in that situation. If an illness comes along or an emergency and you're passing the course and you're doing just fine and you need to suspend the course for the rest of the semester and make it up in the summer, ask me for that incomplete. Details are in the syllabus regarding how to ask and when you can ask in terms of date ranges, but it's pretty broad parameters. So ask for an incomplete if something goes so wrong that you cannot finish the class and you're in good standing at that point. I want everybody to have equal access to this course. So if you have a disability that limits your access, make sure you give us the letter from Disability Resources Center so we can read it and understand what kind of accommodations you require because boy do we want to give them to you. We want everybody to have equal access to this course. Which brings up online etiquette and course constitution. This is at the top of the Moodle page, but I want you to read it. Because it's basically the golden rule that you wouldn't want to treat somebody online like you wouldn't like to be treated. So don't use the distance as an excuse to be mean. But on the other hand, recognize in a democracy and in a college course at a university, there is no greater honor somebody that can, can do to you than disagree with you respectively because they mean, that means they take your ideas seriously. So be ready for debate, but do it in such a way that is not personal or dishonors the person, but in fact looks at the issues and takes those seriously and does so constructively and productively. Now the corollary of that is this. Often when people become aggressive or mean, it's because they sense that they've been offended. They're acting defensively. So try not to become too defensive, and you'll find things often remain very polite, cordial, collegial, and productive, and friendly. So um, don't be too sensitive, but also be kind to others. Finally, Remember, you're advancing a Minnesota tradition. Wonderful. Students have done a range of interesting and useful, productive things in this course. You're part of a course tradition and building on that. So have fun with it. Do well in the course. But also from an ethical standpoint, do good.